Good morning. Today's hearing of the Congressional Executive Commission on China on control of religion in China through digital authoritarianism will come to order. Before we turn to the subject of this hearing, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank President Biden for his recent appointment of five executive branch commissioners to this commission. This marks the first time in nearly six years that the commission includes executive branch commissioners. Their appointment will bolster our ability to bring the expertise and perspective of the various branches of government in our work monitoring human rights and the rule of law in China. As we develop recommendations for legislative, executive, and international action, dialogue to coordinate our efforts will be critical, as it has been in recent years, in implementing legislation this commission spearheaded, such as the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, and more. I look forward to working closely with our new commissioners. Those commissioners are Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Crittenbrink, Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade, Marissa Lago, Under Secretary of Labor for International Affairs, Thea Lee, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, Lisa Peterson, and Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights, Azra Zaya. Welcome to our new commissioners. We are absolutely delighted to have you. Today our hearing focuses on the freedom of religion, particularly recent developments in Chinese authorities' use of technology to crack down on the free exercise of religion. While many of our hearings explore violations of religious freedom in Xinjiang, Tibet, Tibet, and elsewhere, this is our first hearing dedicated to this topic since 2018. Recent Chinese Communist Party steps to use digital repression to strengthen control of religion make this an especially timely hearing. As more religious activity and resources move online, especially in response to COVID, Chinese officials have expanded their use of digital tools to surveil and suppress online religious expression. Invasive surveillance technologies and mass biometric data collection track and monitor religious groups that authorities deem to be a threat. In March of this year, new measures for the administration of internet religious information services went into effect, which require a government issued permit to post religious content online and ban the online broadcasting of religious ceremonies, rites, and services, among a host of other restrictions infringing on Chinese citizens' freedom of religion. These measures control how individuals and communities worship with the aim of sinicizing religion to conform with party priorities. As we will hear today, those priorities are political and social control. To achieve that control, Chinese authorities cite objectives like combating crime and countering so-called religious extremism as they undermine fundamental human rights. The recent UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Xinjiang report calls this what it is, a pretext that conflates personal religious choice with extremism and leads to severe human rights abuses. Our first witness today is one of the most powerful voices in the world when it comes to exposing these abuses and advocating for those who simply wish to exercise their basic rights. And so I'm honored that Nuri Turkel is here with us. After we hear his perspective, our second panel of eminent experts will help us understand the tools of digital surveillance and repression, the risks of this model of authoritarian management of religion spreading to other countries and recommendations for how defenders of religious freedom can respond. And I look forward to our witnesses' testimony. And I'd now like to recognize my co-chair, Congressman McGovern, for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our witnesses. Uh, religious freedom has been at the core of the Commission's work since its founding, and I appreciate your scheduling this hearing on this important topic. The Chinese government's record on religious freedom is as atrocious as it is well documented, including by this commission and by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, whose chair we're honored to have as a witness today. Uh, in our uh, thoughts today are the prisoners of conscience who have had their religious liberty violated by the Chinese government. It is our moral responsibility to help them tell their stories and those of the, pe and, and those of the people 
whose voices do not reach us. Today's hearing will focus on new and insidious methods authorities are using to exert control over religious practice, including online regulation and digital surveillance te uh, technologies. The UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religious Belief last year reported that the Chinese government reportedly uses biometrics, digital surveillance, and personal data for behavioral analysis for identifying, quote, extremist or, quote, unhealthy thought, end quote. He notes that such technologies used in counterterrorism contexts threaten freedom of thought. This aligns with the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights' recent report on Xinjiang, which explained how Chinese officials misuse counterterrorism policy to brutally repress Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims and deny their ability to practice their religion and cultural heritage. This shows how the right to freedom of religion intersects with under, uh, other fundamental rights, the freedoms of speech and association, equal protection, due process, presumption of innocence, all of which are protected under international human rights law. In this light, um, I hope the witnesses will expand on the meaning of citizenization of religion, uh, a process to coerce religious believers' allegiance to the state and the party. We also want to understand how sinicization manipulates the teaching of religious principles to imply they support the party's ideology. It appears the party is exploiting religion as a means to impose social controls. Last month, a group of UN experts, including the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of, Reli of Religion or Belief, issued a statement against the cynical abuse of religion or belief as a tool of discrimination, hostility, and violence, and noted that international law rejects any attempt to call on e either religion or belief or freedom of religion or belief as justification for the destruction of the rights and freedoms of others. USURF shows that the United States seeks to be a, a leader in promoting international religious freedom. To be effective, however, we must live up to the standards we demand of other countries. We lack credibility in criticizing China for using religion as a pretext to restrict other liberties if our own government, including at the state level, engage in the same behavior. So two final points. One, while China only officially recognizes five religions, our analysis and advocacy must recognize that there is a stunningly wide array of religious beliefs and non-beliefs in the country. PRC regulation not only harms religious freedom, but its diversity too. And lastly, as China suffers from a devastating heat wave, I'm interested in how restrictions on religion undermine the cause of environmental protection, given the links between spirituality and nature within Buddhism and Taoism, uh, for example. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the testimony. Thank you very much, Congressman Govern. And uh, Congressman Smith, did you wish to uh, make some opening remarks? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for organizing this very important hearing on an extremely uh, important topic. You know, digital authoritarianism perhaps is uh, too benign a phrase for what we are seeing taking place today in Xi Jinping's China. Rather, it's a digital totalitarianism or techno totalitarianism, if you prefer the alliteration, for nothing more clearly illustrates the fundamental distinction between authoritarianism and totalitarianism than this attempt by Xi Jinping to dictate what one's innermost conscience believes and how one forms the very thoughts to lift up in prayer to God. For Xi Jinping, dictates affect the totality of society, for there is nothing beyond the Communist Party decrees, nothing beyond thought the Communist Party controls. This is not simply authoritarianism, where the dictator lets the priest or preacher speak of things of God and theology, though once he steps out into the political realm and criticizes the government, he is subject, subjected to arrest and silencing. Rather, we see under Xi Jinping the signification of the very content of belief, the rewriting of the words of scripture, be it the Bible, Sutra, or Quran, uh, to conform with Xi Jinping's thought. Indeed, one needs only to go back to the era of Mao Zedong and the worst excesses of the Cultural Revolution to find anything remotely comparable. While Mao particularly hated religions deemed foreign, in reality, he waged a war against anything that smacked of the four olds, old ideas, old culture, old customs, old habits. Ironically, the result of Mao's bringing the entirety of the Chinese society to its knees with a loss of faith, 
in the communist, resulted in a loss of faith in the Communist Party, which subsequent economic growth and prosperity could never fully restore, plus a growth of religious belief and revivalism that we see manifested among the Chinese people today, which Xi Jinping now seeks to further control. In so doing, she is able to draw upon technology, the likes of which the Mao uh, Zedongs could only dream of, from artificial intelligence to tracking apps, which bring us closer than ever before to the uh, nightmare envisioned by George Orwell. Again, this totalitarianism is not simply authoritarianism. In 2018, I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post entitled, The World Must Stand Against China's War on Religion. In it, I stated, and I quote, the ruling Chinese Communist Party has undertaken the most comprehensive attempt to manipulate and control or destroy religious communities since Mao made the eradication of religion a goal of his disastrous cultural revolution half a century ago. Now, she apparently fearing the power of independent religious belief as a challenge to the Communist Party's legitimacy is trying to radically transform religion into the party's servant, employing a draconian policy known as synodization. That was in 2018 when the party was implementing a five-year plan to bend religion to the goal of building a socialist society, as we've seen in documents such as the online outline of the five-year working plan for promoting the synodization of Christianity in our country. That's their plan. That document directed that Protestant Christians uh, contains principles which are applied broadly to all religious believers must be observed, including embrace and support the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, be guided by the core values of socialism and endorse the system, ways, theories, and culture of our country's development, integrate outstanding Chinese traditional culture with advanced socialist culture. Five years from 2018 brings us today. Since then, the repression has only gotten worse with the Chinese Communist Party under Xi exercising greater control over the content of religious education and the content of scripture, while again extending his grip geographically to the once free bastion of Hong Kong, where even the towering giant of religious freedom, uh, Cardinal Zen, was arrested in May of this year and whose trials is sched scheduled to begin next week. And I pause here to call upon Pope Francis to speak out with clarity and conviction on behalf of Cardinal Zen and the persecuted church in Hong Kong and China. And with that, again, I look forward to our witnesses and yield back uh, to, to you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for the hearing. Uh, thank you very much, Congressman Smith. And I'd now like to turn to the witness for our first panel. Nuri Terkel is the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Mr. Terkel was born in a re-education camp, spending the first several months of his life in detention with his mother. He came to the United States in 1995 and was later granted asylum. A lawyer, a foreign policy expert, a human rights advocate. He serves as the chair of the board for the Uyghur Human Rights Project and is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Previously, he served as the president of the Uyghur American Association. Mr. Terkel, the floor is yours. Good morning, Chairman Merkley, Co-Chair McGovern, and honorable members of the commission. Thank you very much for inviting me to testify on behalf of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. I appreciate your steadfast leadership and continuing attention to Chinese government's assaults on religious freedom, targeting many ethnic and religious communities across China, including Uyghur Muslims, Tibetan Buddhist, underground Catholic and Protestant, house church Christians, and Falun Gong practitioners, just to name a few. For decades, the ruling Communist Party has placed religion under tight and comprehensive and coercive control. It, is a, it exercises control by using arbitrary laws, regulations, implementing them through complex but sophisticated web of party and government agencies at all levels, including CCP's infamous United Front Work Department, State Administration for Religious Affairs, and China's public security and state security apparatus. Anyone suspected of violating the CCP's religious policies is severely punished. China's egregious abuses against the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim, Muslims is a case in point that the United States government rightfully has formally recognized as a genocide and crimes against humanity. Even the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights' recent 
A report on Xinjiang uh, confirmed that severe violations have occurred and may amount to crimes against humanity. The crackdown on religion, religion has become increasingly harsh in recent years under the brutal rule of CCP leader Xi Jinping, leading some experts to call this, call his decade-long reign the bitter winter for religious freedom in China. Xi Jinping's new regulations on religion, the measure for the administration of internet religious information services, represents a new law for Xi and his government. Its impact cannot be under, understated as the regulation imposes new restrictions on religious activities, further constricting, uh, constricting the narrow space in which religious groups can operate. This new regulation is particularly significant and adverse effect on independent, unregistered religious communities. Because of the government's severe persecution, many of them rely on online platforms and resources for religious education, training, religious gatherings and worship and other religious activities. These online platforms and smartphone apps are often the only viable means through which these religious communities can carry out activities and connect with one another, especially during the strict COVID-19 lockdown. The negative impact of this regulation is already being felt across China since it went into effect in March 2022. Chinese authorities have recruited hundreds if not thousands of auditors to target and censor religious content on the internet. Chinese and Tibetan Buddhist groups have reported that their websites and web WeChat uh, virtual groups were shut down and no longer accessible. USERF is concerned that this regula regulation will lead to more persecution, abuses, and especially for groups with foreign connections. Regulations also imposes tighter restriction on state-sanctioned religious groups. These groups are required to submit detailed information to authorities to apply for a permit to operate online. In addition, they are required to self-censor their religious material on the internet. Therefore, even state-sanctioned religious groups are not safe and could be punished if they are found to be non-compliant with the government policies. We are all aware of the Chinese government's routinely monitoring actions and censoring all kinds of online content, including religious materials. But this re new regulation is the first of its kind designed to specifically target religious content on the internet and has created chilling effect on many religious groups and individuals. It is tantamount to total ban on religious activities as many, as many groups are no longer able to operate in person or online. The order, the order to cleanse the internet of any exposure to religion came from the highest echelon of the party. Xi Jinping himself. At the 2016 China National Conference on Religious Work, attended by high-level party and government officials, Xi Jinping himself expressed particular displeasure toward the phenomenon, phenomenon of internet religions. Five years later, at the 2021 National Conference on Religious Work, she again emphasized the need to strengthen the management of religious affairs on the internet. It is important to note that Xi Jinping sees religion as fundamentally connected to national security. As a consequence, he has underscored the need to fight against foreign infiltration through the use of religion and religious extremism, including the internet. This new regulation is an integral part of CCP's sinicization policy to subjugate and control all ethnic and religious groups, coercing support and loyalty to the CCP rule and its policies or else facing severe consequences. Mr. Chairman, this new regulation is the latest example of the CCP expanding and refining its techno-authoritarianism toolkit at home, and it tries to intimidate and coerce its citizens to perpetuate its rule. Ethnic minority region of Tibet and Xinjiang in particular have borne the brunt of CCP's technology-enhanced brutality in recent years, as this commission has well documented. The CCP has been exporting its techno-authoritarianism overseas to countries with poor human rights records as well. Oppressive regimes can emulate the Chinese model to persecute political dissidents and human rights advocates. The United States government and companies must continue to ensure that critical technology is not exported to China and contribute to any religious freedom abuses abroad. USERF also recommends that the United States 
government imposed more targeted sanctions on Chinese officials and entities responsible for severe religious freedom violations, especially those within the United Front Department, United Front Work Department, State Administration for Religious Affairs, as well as China's public security and state security apparatus. These entities are directly involved in drafting, implementation, and enforcement of the new regulations on internet religious activities. In closing, I'd like to thank the Commission again for the opportunity to testify and for your attention to the plight of all persecuted ethnic and religious groups in China. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, and we'll now uh, have a round of uh, questions from the members of the Commission who are, are with us. I believe we're allocating uh, seven minutes uh, to each, each member, which I'll encourage people to uh, uh, wrap up their remarks if they they're hitting that that boundary, and I'll begin, uh, Mr. Terkel, by noting that you have been a target of Chinese government's intimidation and threats, as have many other Uyghurs and others globally. As this transnational repression targets Uyghurs and Hong Kongers and Tibetans and Falun Gong practitioners, human rights advocates, journalists and others outside of uh, China's borders, what should the United States do to address this problem? Um, so Chairman, thank you very much for bringing up my own um, uh, experience, uh, at least in the past um, a decade or so. Um, I came to the United States, as you noted, in 1995. Um, now I'm an American citizen, a US official, and Chinese government is retaliating against me and my family for my service in the U.S. government and advocating strong human rights policy uh, through my professional work and personal advocacy. Uh, last December, I got sanctioned uh, by Xi Jinping's China. Uh, and this May, um, I was also sanctioned by Putin's Russia, where that two of the world's worst human rights abusers have sanctioned me. The consequences is very, very serious for my being sanctioned. I still have my mother uh, living in communist China, whom I have not seen since 2004. The last time I saw her was in, when she was here with my late father for my law school graduation. And I don't even know if I will see her again. Uh, Chinese, this is a hostage taking. This is a direct retaliation against a US official. And this is a, a retaliation against an American citizen who's exercising his or her freedom of speech in the United States. So I am uh, uh, grateful uh, yourself and other members of Congress have uh, been paying attention to this, but we need to have a clear policy uh, that includes um, a, a legislative mandate. Uh, as far as I know, there's no... Uh, uh, legal tools available to uh, go after those individuals uh, uh, engaging in transnational repression. I, I do believe that uh, there are goodwill within our government, but we need a clear guidance. Uh, I think the Congress can play a significant role. And also, I would like to see a law enforcement um, uh, act a little bit more uh, uh, coherently, even aggressively. The FBI put out a bulletin, which was very, very helpful. But at the same time, I'm sensing that the Uyghur American community felt a little hopeless that the U.S. government, even law enforcement um, uh, role is clearly uh, uh, described, uh, mandated in the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. That has not been done. And also, our government needs to understand what transnational repression entails. That could be done through uh, annual human rights report. That could be done through public education. That could be done through uh, hearings like this. And, and finally, I, I like to see the, the officials responsible for designing, carrying out uh, transnational repression, whether it be in Tehran, whether it be in Moscow, whether it be in elsewhere or Beijing, face consequences. They should not be allowed to come to the United States. Uh, and our liberal uh, democracy allies, our allies in uh, liberal democracies, should consider similar measures. So if why would they stop these kind of behaviors if they don't face consequences? It's quite simple. 
So uh, we need to act this in societally, governmentally, and also in tandem with our partners and allies who values human rights, who values freedom of speech, who values uh, religious freedom. Mr. Chairman, you have to unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, happens at least once a day. Uh, thank you uh, for your response to that. I'm going to keep raising the issue of transnational repression. We're often thinking about the human rights issues inside other countries, and certainly that's our role as a commission in terms of what's happening inside China, but we also have to realize what China is doing outside of, of China and inside the United States uh, in violating the human rights of uh, those resident uh, uh, here. But let me turn back to what's happening inside of China. In your testimony, you note the connection Xi Jinping draws between the management of religion and national security. And as I noted in my opening remarks, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights called this linkage a pretext for serious human rights violations in Xinjiang. What more can be done so that Chinese government and other governments cannot hide behind this so-called counterterrorism or counter-extremism uh, strategy to flout uh, binding international uh, human rights laws in regard to religion? Um, thank you, Chairman, for that excellent question. Um, the national security, um, at the, since 2014, uh, the Chinese government uh, through national security strategy, clearly stated that uh, the, the freedom that we treasure, uh, that they cannot stand, uh, is part of their national security concern and their constant battle against the uh, quote-unquote Western influence or foreign influence. To the CCP, uh, even though religious freedom is, is something constitutionally guaranteed uh, with a specific language, uh, such as be a certain religious faith, the party has ne uh, never uh, interfered or allowed its citizens to practice. Uh, that's only in, uh, on paper. On national security concern, the, the, the uh, convenience uh, the Chinese find in, uh, in particular the Uyghur religion is the fact that it's can, it can be easily linked uh, to uh, counterterrorism or uh, fight against three forces, as they often say, uh, fight against extremism, religious, uh, religious extremism, separatism, and terrorism. Even to this day, after UN uh, recognized that there is a crimes against humanity underway, the Chinese top diplomats uh, here in Washington and Beijing and Geneva still repeating those same lines. And they may also underestimate the intelligence of the people in the free world that they can tell that this is not the type of counterterrorism that the United States government sees or the, our European allies sees. Secretary Blinken said it very clearly in his 60 Minutes interview that the United States does not believe that the US and China is fighting same type of uh, terrorism. So the Chinese can say this 15 times, even more, but does not hold any water. But here's the, the important aspect of, of what they're trying to do. This is all about preemptive um, policing. So the Chinese government, uh, the religious belief now linked to national security, is a cancerous tumor. It needs to be cut or killed with a spray of chemicals. This is part of their public remarks. As CCP, for example, likens uh, Uyghur Islam to mental illness, and followers are uh, abnormal. Uh, therefore, as former ambassador to Washington, uh, Chinese ambassador Sui Tianke said, those people need to go through thought transformation to be normalized. He said this on CNN uh, to American people. So those tumors, those thought viruses to the Chinese government is, is a national security concern. So it needs to be taken out before they metastasize a spray to vital organs. And what do we do? I don't think that the United States government treats national uh, religious freedom, uh, human rights as a national security concern. We always deal with it once the it turns into uh, humanitarian crisis, genocide, war crimes. It becomes very costly operations. So I'd like to see our government in its own foreign policy agenda 
as in it intended even to to put in place the International Religious Freedom Act. We need to have, we need to put this as an integral part of our national security agenda, specifically uh, in our pol foreign policy uh, engagements, of, uh, diplomatic engagement with, with the governments that has dismal human rights, religious freedom uh, records. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your, your insights and your use of your, your role in the Commission on International Religious Freedom uh, to be such a powerful uh, voice for religious freedom in the world. Congressman and Co-Chair McGovern. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Trickell. Um, next month, the Sino-Vatican Agreement uh, is up for renewal. And last week, Cardinal Secretary of State Pietro Parolin expressed his confidence that, that uh, the agreement would be renewed, saying that, and I quote, when you negotiate with someone, you must always start from recognizing their good faith, end quote. I mean, uh, really? I mean, I, I certainly would not uh, uh, have said that, a statement like that. But uh, let me ask you, what is your assessment of the state of Catholics in China today? And are they subject to the same level of cynicization as other religions? And as uh, Mr. Smith pointed out in his opening statement, uh, Cardinal Zen goes on trial next month in Hong Kong. Uh, do you think that Vatican authorities have done enough to defend him? Um, we have been publicly expressing concerns over the silence at the Vatican uh, with respect to um, uh, persecuted Catholics in, uh, in Hong Kong and in mainland China. Um, I think that the, the China's constant battle against Western influence by and large includes the Christian Catholics in, in China. To the Chinese government, uh, that the foreign religion, the concept of foreign religion essentially uh, entails uh, Uyghur Muslims and the Christian Catholic community in China. Uh, now they test it out, it worked, and no one essentially paid price for it within the Chinese leadership uh, with the mildest criticism around the world. Uh, thank God that we live in a country that has shown the leadership in this effort. They haven't really uh, the cost have been, has not been as serious enough to the CCP leadership. And the, the Catholic community in, the, in China um, does not have the type of voice that they should have in this kind of discussion. And I worry that the same method being implemented in the Uyghur homeland without much consequences now will be implemented in the Christian community. We're already seeing signs of uh, similar testing, testing practices removing cross from the top of the churches in China, and also replace, uh, putting, putting up Xi Jinping's pictures and the walls inside the places of worship. In the case of the Uyghurs, it's, it's no go. You don't look at images to practice your religion. So now with the cynicization effort, they are rewriting Bible, rewriting the Quran to make it communist ideology as a religion. Communism is not a religion, maybe a religion for Xi Jinping and his cohorts, but it's not a religion. There's, there, the religion, Abrahamic religion and communism are incompatible. So this is a destructive effort. And again, and again, I will have to repeat this, I don't know how many times, what is the cause that the CCP leadership suffered? Yes, we have imposed sanctions. It has been going along a proposition. The United States have shown leadership. Where are the European allies? Where are the other liberal democracies? who believe in human rights, who believe in religious freedom. So that unless this becomes a collaborative global effort, we impose serious costs on the CCP leadership, they will continue this with impunity. Thank you. Uh, uh, I appreciate your response. Um, Mr. Trickell, you know, Tibetan Buddhists value the preservation of the natural environment uh, as an integral part of their spiritual belief system as we hear often from His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama. Uh, this is true of others, including Chinese Buddhists, Taoists, and folk religion pr practitioners. How should we look at environmental destruction, including that uh, wrought by climate change, as impinging on the religious freedom of these uh, faith traditions? The both uh, Tibetan Plateau um, and the, the Uyghur homeland uh, uh, some people describe it as a Teklamakan desert, have been an earlier targets for uh, the CCP's uh, uh, environmental destruction de degradation uh, efforts. 
In the case of Xinjiang, for example, they've been testing nuclear weapons uh, since 1960s. They still use uh, dirty coal to make polysilicon. In the case of Tibetans, they've been uh, uh, destroying uh, uh, forest, uh, and there's a serious water pollution uh, in the Tibetan area. And also the, um, the, the Chinese government's attempts to uh, mass migrating, or moving uh, people from the internal uh, parts of uh, inland uh, Chinese cities, also creating uh, a pressure on the uh, local uh, uh, people's lives. Uh, that it could be as simple as jobs, that it could be simple as uh, the resources. So in the case of Tibetans, I believe that the Tibetan people um, have been, in the recent years, have not been talked about uh, enough as that been the case in the past. I think we need to start paying attention. I worry that uh, the Chinese is, is trying to buy more buy time, waiting um, Dalai, Dalai Lama's uh, time expires and it will be a disastrous uh, circumstance situation, both inside and outside of Tibet. Um, we still don't know the whereabouts of Benjamin Lama, right. uh, and this is this should concern us. So this all, again, again just boils on to uh, CCP's fear of religion. And actually, this has been scientifically proven in the society the, where the government respects religious freedom that naturally brings stability, that naturally makes the society prosperous. So the Chinese, instead of spending billions of dollars in domestic security, uh, uh, scaring uh, uh, its own population, were fearful of their own population, and engaging in destructive efforts to destroy this proud Tibetan nation, the Uyghur nation, Catholics, and others, they should be focusing on uh, letting people to be uh, let, letting people to be left alone, uh, letting them to live the life that they wanted to live. So I think the, the, in the long term, the Chinese Communist Party not only been a, a disastrous to the worldwide um, rights uh, concerns, but also creating a, a long-lasting um, effect on the psyche, uh, on the social health of the Chinese society. Right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back my remaining time. Thank you, uh, Congressman Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first of all, to Chairman Terkel, uh, thank you for your extraordinary leadership, your courage, the fact that you uh, have family members, including your mom, who are at grave risk by the Chinese Communist Party, and yet you speak with such clarity and such precision uh, and courage. Uh, can't thank you enough for that leadership. Uh, you, you're a blessing to the Commission uh, on International Religious Freedom to have you walking point. So thank you again for that leadership. Um, I, uh, and to the point of the, the Vatican agreement, uh, when I was chairman of this commission, I did travel over to the Vatican. I asked Cardinal uh, Paralin, the Secretary of State, not to engage in uh, that agreement, not to agree to uh, giving Xi Jinping veto power over bishops, which I think is absurd. Uh, and it completely undermines the underground Catholic Church. Uh, and I have met many members of that church in country, including Bishop uh, Shu of Baoding Province, who was out of prison, went back to prison, spent more than almost 40 years. No one knows for sure how many, because uh, he may have been, has have died since. Uh, so it's it's a you know, the, the underground Catholic Church um, has been hurt severely by this. And I also think it has a chilling effect on the church's voice in speaking out for the Uyghurs and speaking out for the Tibetan Buddhists, for the Protestants, so that the solidarity with all those persecuted faiths, Falun Gong, uh, does not have the same articulation that it would otherwise have. So I, I do hope that the church will reconsider its position very seriously. Let me also say, you know, you in response to the chairman's question, it was a good one. What, what do we do now? Um, I would respectfully say that it's time. You know, we do have Magdiski sanctions. Uh, you know, we, we are trying to hold those most responsible uh, for their egregious behavior to account. Uh, but in March, I introduced H.R. 7193 uh, called the China Trade Relations Act of 2022. And that would reestablish human rights linkage to our uh, MFN, to our trade relationship with China. Uh, this is not a partisan dig, but in, on May 26, 1994, Bill Clinton delinked most favored nation status from uh, human rights. Uh, and I believe very, very passionately 
But that's when the Chinese Communist Party said they just care about profits. And, you know, the balance of trade in last year was what, well over $350 billion. Uh, they are an export economy. And if we had human rights linkage that was serious, that said, unless there's serious sustained progress in human rights, and of course, religious freedom is at the core of all of this, uh, there would be an amelioration of their policy and I think reform when they think we're bluffing and we just talk and um, don't have any linkage to trade, uh, I think uh, we lose an opportunity to protect the sanctity of religion, of all the religions uh, and religious practices in, in China. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, you might want to speak to this, Turkel, uh, uh, if you'd like. But I do think um, we need to get even more serious about this. Uh, had we had it since 1994, I do think that reformers of some kind would have made sure that this exporting economy called China uh, would have made systemic changes uh, in their barbaric practices, especially their persecution of religious freedom. So Chairman Turkle, if you might want to speak to that, um, I would appreciate it. And uh, if not, I understand. But um, uh, I do think we have to get even more serious. Uh, I mean, China has so exploited the trade relationship and has so uh, brought to their shore uh, dual use items that now have transformed them into a superpower. Uh, so even on the military side alone, uh, we have sold them the rope that someday they uh, hope to hang us with. So if you could, uh, Chairman Turkle. Yes, th thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we Definitely, we have to do a lot. I mean, I need to uh, use this time to uh, um, bring up something um, a, a support that supports um, your uh, your ideas, which was uh, last December, uh, most people in the United States around the world uh, unnoticed something very significant, uh, which was the United States government, the Biden administration, sanctioned uh, the, the added uh, the Chinese Military Medical Academy and its 11 affiliates to Commerce Department's entity list, which is an export ban list, as you know, for developing brain control weaponry to be used on ethno-religious groups, especially the Uyghurs. Uh, this just had a, didn't catch much attention. So this kind of focused, uh, I think this kind of focused, targeted uh, sanctioning, uh, entity listing need to continue to happen. And why would the Chinese government develop brain control weaponry to be used? Again, to the earlier point, they, are not, they used to control the behavior of the Uyghur people now, of religious communities, but now they wanted to control their body. And what, what this weaponry does essentially controls uh, the communication between your body and your brain. Uh, this is this that people need to look at, and this is the type of regime that should deeply disturb, should should come across as disturbing, alarming news to all of us. And as we as we know, technology and economic development are supposed to foster freedom and improve our lives. But the Chinese progress, as some people uh, uh, flattering uh, make flattering statements on TV on their. Uh, uh, academic papers is essentially uh, in a specifically Chinese uh, science and technology and economic development and not a moral progress. The Chinese technology enabled, it has been enabling, facilitating collective punishment and enslavement of vulnerable population. And now the Chinese surveillance, this technology has become a part of lives, ordinary people's lives. It's in their homes. They have a QR codes in the doors, and it's in, in, the, in the places of worship, in churches, mosque, temple, everything, every aspect of the people within communist China are subject to this level of persuasive and sophisticated surveillance. And we got to do something about it. The one thing that I have in mind, I think that the Congress should consider, is putting in place something like the Foreign uh, Corrupt Practices Act. In the 1970s, when this law was enacted, it was not really known to most people. It just <laughs> become a very effective tool around the world today. UK has a similar measures. And now, instead of going to the foreign countries, playing by their rules, we're exporting good corporate practices. The entire global uh, business communities follows FCPA. We need to have something like that when it comes to uh, uh, tech authoritarianism, authoritarianism, digital surveillance. This is a serious problem. This is about our future. If we don't stop this, if we don't blunt this, this will become a serious problem 
uh, uh, create enormous challenges to civil liberties, religious freedom, even in the democratic process, as, 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 as simple as some <clears throat> dictatorship or authoritarian regime will be monitoring uh, uh, voting records, monitoring the opposition party's activities. That is a real threat to democracy at bare minimum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Feel back. Thank you, Congressman Smith. And now we're going to turn to the Senate side, Senator Ossoff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Turkel, Chair Turkel, for your service and your testimony today. I uh, led a delegation to India uh, about a week and a half ago uh, and had the opportunity in Dharamshala to meet with leaders uh, of the CTA and the Tibetan government in exile. Can you characterize, uh, based upon uh, your knowledge and understanding, uh, CCP's use of uh, digital technology for purposes of repression and control in Tibet? Um, thank you, Senator. Um, it, people, um, we've been hearing this and reading about it, that uh, this is Iranian statement, actually. The, the surveillance technology has been developed, tested on the Uyghurs, and now it's spreading around China. Actually, the, it's the other way around. It initially started in mainland China, where this person that the United States government sanctioned, uh, Chen Zhenguo, who was the Communist Party chief in Tibet, it was initially implemented in Tibet. It was very successful. And he got promoted by Xi Jinping in August 2016. And he took his apparatus, the, his team, his security detail over to Rimchi, set up this command center in an old hotel. This was profiled in the New Yorker magazine. So the Tibetan people actually were affected by this early on, but we failed to pay attention. We failed to detect the early warning signs and that it become a much bigger uh, operation when Chen Zhuanguo took the same practice over to Rimchi. He was given resources, he was given authority, even a seat in the Politburo. So that, that, that essentially uh, uh, it, it paved the way for today's uh, uh, Uyghur nightmare. So Tibetan people uh, not only been subject to that, now, as I noted earlier, uh, have been pretty much forgotten. We need to pay attention to them. We need, they, are, they are also facing existential threat. Uh, they are facing a serious political threat stemming from Beijing. They're also facing a serious leadership threat uh, because Panjian Lama still is uh, in, um, in under uh, Chinese custody, has been disappeared. So, um, uh, and in first thing first, I would, we have to implement um, the existing laws uh, uh, designed to protect the Tibetan people's rights. I'm glad that we have undersecretary uh, of, of state who are uh, a special coordinator for Tibet. In the previous several years, um, somebody who knows the Tibetan leadership and Tibetan community, I was so frustrated that our government did not even open its door. Uh, Lobsang Sangai, for example, uh, former president of the Central Tibetan Administration, were not even allowed to enter the White House, were not even enter the State Department. Our officials end up going to the hotel to meet with them. Out, I mean, this kind of stuff, I mean, we, the laws are put in place to follow. We, we, we have to implement the laws with respect to the Uyghurs, the Hong Kongers and Tibetans. Otherwise, it just, uh, you know, it's meaningless uh, effort. Um, first thing first, we have to go back to the way that we uh, treated the Tibetan issues a decade or so ago with the seriousness. Uh, I know that we have not been able to make the progress that we wanted to see, but we have not been persistent in our efforts. Thank you, uh, Chairman Turkel. And I'd like to ask you as well uh, how you have observed and understood the same technologies, techniques, and tools that have been used to surveil and repress religious minorities have been used to target journalists. The, the, so it, it cannot, you know, I can't uh, emphasize enough of the sophistication of the Chinese uh, surveillance. Uh, the, the, unlike our government, unlike the other governments, the Chinese have no uh, resources problem. They have been pouring in zillions of dollars uh, into the R&D uh, and also control of those tech companies. Um, the reason that the journalists have been surveilled, uh, kicked out uh, a couple of years ago, they start coming back 
uh, for a long time, Washington Post did not even have a single report until recently in China. So it, it, again, the Chinese wants to hide their crimes. The Chinese wants to continue to uh, conflate, confuse the international community. The Chinese government con wants to continue to uh, engage in disinformation because journalists, specifically Western journalists, could do investigative journalism. They can, they can try to get to the bottom of it. I mean, this West, attack on Western journalists have started when even Venjabo was a prime minister. Bec like uh, M Melissa Chen, uh, the former Al, Al Jazeera journalist, had, it was the, one of the first ones kicked out of China. What, what she did was just doing her job. The Chinese could not stand her. And this practice is still continuing. Are we doing the same thing with their reporters? Uh, is the social media doing the same thing? For example, in today, there's a guy from the uh, Global Times uh, it puts out inflammatory, offensive statements uh, on social media and as Twitter tolerates. Whereas our journalists could not even go there to report from the ground. So this needs to be addressed uh, at the highest level. And also one other thing that I need to uh, point out, the surveillance of journalists and surveillance of ordinary citizens. High, Chinese high-tech firms are essentially state entity. It's an SOE, state-owned enterprise. Uh, as reported and uh, written in several books recently, Chinese government has a number of red phones. This was also profiled in the book that, um, uh, that I, 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 I wrote about. Um, a German scholar, uh, German journalist, K. Strutmatter, has a book called We Have Been Harmonized. In it, it describes every single uh, Chinese high-tech CEO's desk has a direct, uh, red phone directly connected to the leadership. So the leadership in CCP apparatus controls the high-tech. So if the CCP does not like any journalists, any citizen, any entities, or even foreign officials, they can order them to do the things that they serves their interest. So this is intertwined, interconnected system. And I don't think, again, we're paying enough attention. Thank you for your testimony and your service. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to following up with you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Senator. And we'll turn back to the House side and Congresswoman uh, Hartzler is with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Chairman Turkle, for your courageous leadership and providing us uh, with the information that is so, so sorely needed. <clears throat> I'd like for you to expand a little bit on uh, some of the comments you've made uh, here, just answering questions, but also to your testimony, uh, where you talk about that the CCP has been exporting its techno authoritarianism overseas to other countries, and um, that oppressive regime, regimes are emulating this China model of both political dis dissidents and human rights advocates. Um, and you say that uh, our government must continue to ensure the critical technology is not exported to China and contribute to the religious freedom abuses. I wondered if you could just kind of list several examples of both countries where this has been exported to and specifically what critical technology you're referring to. Are you referring to 5G technology or what, just uh, you've talked about Tibet a little bit, but could you kind of just outline some of the countries where they're exporting and specifically what they're exporting so we can be uh, very fully clear and aware of what we need to watch for and we need to try to uh, stop. Thank you, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, first of all, the equipment. Uh, their equipment um, still gets support from our technology firms, software, hardware. Uh, several, a few years ago, when Huawei was um, added to the entity list, Financial Times reported uh, a conversation with one of the folks who work for Huawei. So this person essentially said, with this entity list designation, our phones, our equipments just become a frame. And, and this, will be, uh, this, will, this will be disastrous for the company in order to, for this company to catch up with the technology, with the support that they're receiving from the Silicon Valley. It takes decades. So that's the reality of this uh, Chinese high-tech industry. And I can't say this, I'm not a tech person, um, but I can say this with, uh, based on the, uh, the reading that I've done, the research that I've done, that Silicon Valley has been complicit. We need to look into their role. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to eliminate the gray areas in the laws and regulations. We need to make it difficult for the Silicon Valley companies to continue to find a way to get a waiver. 
Even any country, the, uh, company's entities being added to the entity list or sanctioned, there's a way to go around them. There's a thing called special license that the OFAC issues. There is a way that they can get a waiver to continue their business practices. Uh, and the other thing, uh, and, and it, the Hikvision, for example. Hikvision, um, even we need to look at this um, uh, societally, governmentally that uh, based on the book that I was referring to, um, our hospitals, our schools, uh, prisons, in one instance, one of the military bases, or even um, our embassy in Afghanistan, not, not, not being used, we're using Hick vision cameras. We know that this is a government. Uh, this is a state-owned enterprise. This is, this is linked to the CCP. So in the United States, even today, you can find Hick vision cameras. It's available. This is wrong. And then the third thing that we need to do is we need to talk to our European allies. This is not about the United States stopping a certain country or a company uh, for our geopolitical interest. This is about the future. The European co community is still not in, on the same page as we are when it comes to these serious uh, threats. And finally, we need to have a, 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 a judicial process uh, law enforcement process to go after the businesses, the Chinese high tech that has a business presence in the United States. There's no international law that addresses their complicity in the human rights abuses and the genocide, for example, in China. But we do have federal courts. Some of the Chinese companies are, uh, that are present in the United States subject to the local federal court jurisdiction. Why can't the Justice Department open an investigation, look into those companies that have a business presence here, have been implicated in the ongoing human rights abuses? Again, laws are uh, put in place to implement, enforce. So, so this, has to be, this has to be looked at in different, diplomatically, legislatively, and specifically in a law enforcement aspect. Thank you very much. Uh, I introduced the legislation to the NDAA a few years ago, specifically so that Hike Vision could not be sold anymore in our country, the video surveillance cameras. And so I'm very interested and very concerned to hear um, that they're still uh, present. And so definitely I will be looking into that. I know many of us here on uh, this hearing are very concerned about that. So thank you for giving us an update on that. That's very concerning. Um, I'm, on another subject, though, I wanted to bring up um, something that through the Defending Freedoms Project, I'm a congressional advocate for three Chinese Christian prisoners, uh, Pastor John Saw, uh, pa Pastor Jean Shea Joji, and Pastor Wang Yi. Uh, and these brave men uh, can be searched and read about more in their stories on the Internet. So my, but my question is, do you think that the CCP's efforts to censor and shut down certain online information pertaining to religion will have an impact on our access to the pastor's information here in the United States? And how would you recommend that advocates continue to support current and future victims of religious persecution should access to their stories be limited or removed? Um. Congresswoman, this is, a, this is such an important question. Not only we are not going to be able to get access, but just a, a simple communication with anyone outside of the country that are perceived uh, as hostile to the CCP has a, has a consequences. You know, they, they monitor uh, in and out phone calls, communications, your uh, uh, access to certain web pages. Um, <laughs> In, in, you know, again, I keep sorry for keep bringing up the, um, the, the Uyghur situation. The Uyghur phones had to be scanned by mobile police, the mobile police station set up on the streets. It, we, have no, we don't have information as to if this is the same practice that the Chinese um, have in inland Chinese cities. But one place um, that already been successful, it's reasonable to expect that the Chinese will transfer this over to the other uh, provinces. Because again, this is, a, this is such an insecure um, a regime that it's fearful of its own population, fearful of uh, people of faith, uh, people of, uh, of reasoning uh, or desire to be left alone. So they will do this at any cost with any justification. So I, I, it's a very a troubling trend. Um, the online database, not only in China, 
but outside of China has been also subject to various attacks. Um, yeah, some uh, NGO websites get regularly attacked uh, by Chinese hackers. And also now we have the new trend. When we, I don't know if this is, the, this is the case in here today, but uh, when I was testifying uh, uh, in the summer of 2021 uh, at a HVAC hearing, the YouTube channel had lots of disinformation on the right bar while having the hearing on the left side of the screen. So, so our, our firms, again, need to step up. We need to be able to technologically uh, uh, be able to support those who are courageous to share information with us so that we can assist them. We also wanted to find a way to protect those who have been uh, critical uh, sharing information, as we know that there's no journalists on the ground, we have to rely on those courageous people to get information. Otherwise, we will not be able to help. Even the UN report, a recently published report, cites several individuals providing information that are not fearful of their lives. So, um, again, this is something that Congress could help. And I, I'm afraid that without cost, without uh, pushback, Chinese will even do more harm to uh, uh, vulnerable religious and ethnic communities. Very, very concerning. I sure appreciate this and uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. And thank you, Mr. Trickell, for your testimony, for your service to our country, and your tireless advocacy for freedom of religion. We will now turn to our second panel, and I'll invite the witnesses for our second panel to turn on their, their videos. And I'll give them an introduction, then we'll, we'll dive in. Let's start with uh, Carrie Kazel, an associate professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame, where she specializes in the study of contemporary Chinese and Russian politics, authoritarianism, and religion and politics. She is the author of Religion and Authoritarianism, Cooperation, Conflict, and the Consequences. She is also the co-editor of Citizens, and the state and authoritarian regimes comparing China and Russia. And I like to note that she previously taught at the University of Oregon. Chris Messerol is research director of the Brookings Institution's Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technology Initiative and a fellow in the Brookings Foreign Policy Program. His research is focused currently on the increasing exploitation of digital technology <coughs> excuse me, by authoritarian regimes and violent non-state actors. He's the co-author of a report on how Russia and China are exporting digital authoritarianism and has testified to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom on the digital repression of religious minorities in China. And Emily Dirks is a postdoctoral fellow at the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on the policing of so-called target people, Chinese citizens who the Ministry of Public Security views as threats to social stability and national security, as well as police-led mass DNA collection and surveillance programs. Two of his most recent publications concern mass DNA collection programs in China. Thank you, all of the three of you, for joining us for this hearing. Without objection, your full written statements will be entered into uh, the record, and we ask that you keep your remarks to five minutes. And so we'll begin with Dr. Kazel. Good morning, and thank you. Chair Merkley, Co-Chair McGovern, and distinguished members of the Commission, I'm honored to participate in today's hearing. In my remarks, I will focus on three long-term strategies used to assert Chinese government control over religion and the implications for religious groups on the ground. As we know, contemporary China represents one of the most restrictive environments for religion and religious communities around the globe, and the reach of the Chinese state into religious life is extensive. This first strategy of control utilizes technology. In the past decades, strategies of religious management have expanded with the development of digital and surveillance technologies. These technologies facilitate systematic and coordinated efforts to collect information, to monitor, and to target religious communities, especially those perceived as operating outside of state-set parameters or viewed as extremists. 
the Chinese surveillance state monitors social media to identify and collect information on religious believers and their networks. It uses phone apps to transmit information on user activity and their locations, facial recognition technology, and CCTV cameras at temples, churches, and mosques to keep tabs on not only attendance, but also the content of religious services. Religious life is ostensibly monitored at every level, in public, in private, and virtually. The implications. First, expanding digital technologies accelerate the crackdown on unreg unregistered religious groups. These are groups not formally affiliated with government-sponsored patriotic associations, and they operate in private. They tend to include Protestant house churches, underground Catholic churches, but also unregistered Buddhists, Taoists, Muslims, as well as practitioners of folk and popular religions. The growing sophistication of the Chinese surveillance state means it is increasingly difficult for these communities to operate under the radar. A second implication is that control of religious expression online is increasing. Online forums, microblogs, instant messaging platforms face increased censorship. These online communities are seen as vehicles of, quote, religious infiltration and sources of religious growth, especially among Chinese young people on college campuses. A second strategy is cynicization. Religious communities have been asked over the past decade to cynicize. This is a long-term strategy to manage religious life, to insulate it from, quote, foreign influence by making it more Chinese, but more importantly, to instill fility to the party state. Cynicization prioritizes the integration of politics and ideology, as well as support for the leadership of the party at the center of religion. Now, at present in China, there is no central policy articulating how cynicization should develop. Instead, this has been left up to the five patriotic associations to introduce their own plans. Now, it is within each of these plans we can see the, see the clear political direction. The Catholic plan, for instance, asserts that cynicization requires the conscientious approval of politics and obedience to the national regime. The Protestant plan calls on pastors to harmonize biblical teachings with ideology and to preach core socialist values. The Buddhist plan prioritizes the study of Xi Jinping thought. Even Taoism, an indigenous religion in China, has developed a plan to cynicize. The takeaway here is that cynicization centers on the partification of religion. It is a strategy to politically reorient China's faithful, not embrace traditional culture or Chinese values. One implication is that cynicization efforts on the ground are currently quite uneven. Religious communities have some flexibility in interpreting cynicization, and the party state seems content to allow some latitude, so long as the efforts show necessary reverence. A second implication is that the long-term impact remains uncertain. It remains to be seen whether cynicization will reign in religion, cultivate love and loyalty to the party state, or divide religious communities internally. Historically in China, processes of cynicization actually encouraged religious growth. So this may be one outcome. The final strategy I wish to highlight on controlling religion is more outward facing. This is the so-called three troop strategy launched under Xi Jinping, which brings together party and government officials, prominent religious representatives and academics to counter what is perceived as US led international efforts to promote religious freedom. The implication here is that Chinese strategies of religious management are shifting. They're shifting from defense to offense and from domestic to global. With the broader goal to counter and to quiet foreign advocacy for religious freedom. I'd like to close with a few recommendations. U.S. advocacy for religious groups in China calls to protect religious freedom and human rights can backfire. Because we know this is seen as evidence domestically in China of fomenting instability or foreign forces trying to divide the country. However, there are steps we can and should take to support freedom of religion and belief bilateral engagement. We need to consistently raise issues of religious freedom and human rights in China in public and in private meetings with our Chinese counterparts. We should work with U.S. allies and partners to take similar action, especially in the Muslim-majority world. 
Second, we need to build expertise. We need to prioritize funding domestically to maintain U.S. expertise in China. It is a national security imperative that we increase, increase support and training of American students and scholars in China and Chinese language. In closing, I'd like to thank the Commission for your attention and leadership on these important set of issues. My written testimony elaborates on the strategies and offers additional recommendations. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazel. And we'll turn now to Dr. Meserol. And doctor, if you're speaking, you may be muted at this moment. Uh, Chairman Merkley, uh, Co-Chairman McGovern, uh, and distinguished members of the commission, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this morning on such a vital and important issue. Although there is a growing awareness of the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party's model of digital authoritarianism, the extent to which its, its expansion has converged with the Xi regime's increasing restrictions on religious freedom is far less well known. I'm grateful for the chance to share my thoughts on how that convergence came to pass, the unprecedented challenges it poses for freedom of religion within China and around the globe, and how the United States should respond. After the arrival of the internet in China in the late 1980s, the, the Chinese Communist Party was quick to recognize both the risks and opportunities posed by digital technology and began building out an unprecedented apparatus for online censorship and surveillance. When Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping took power in 2012, he moved quickly to consolidate that apparatus under his control while also investing heavily in the equipment, infrastructure, and training to build out real-world surveillance programs like Skynet, Smart Cities, Sharp Eyes, and early pilots of the social credit system. Since these systems often lack due process and public oversight, the Xi regime has effectively built out the world's most comprehensive digital architecture for repression. Unfortunately, the Xi regime has also, in tandem, built out a legal and bureaucratic architecture for religious repression, too. Most notably, Beijing has sought to rein in what it views as religious extremism in Xinjiang and Tibet, but the Xi regime's efforts to curtail religious freedom extend well beyond its counterterrorism policy. In 2016, Xi held a two-day conference on religion, during which he previewed strict new religious regulations across China and urged the CCP to, quote, actively guide the adaptation of religions. Several years later, another set of regulations came into effect requiring religious organizations to, quote, spread the principles and policies of the Chinese Communist Party. These regulations were so far reaching that a Chinese Catholic priest lamented, in practice, your religion no longer matters. If you are Buddhist or Taoist or Muslim or Christian, the only religion allowed is faith in the Chinese Communist Party. Regrettably, the Xi regime's effort to control all religious life then directly converged with its effort to expand digital surveillance in late 2021. Although the Chinese officials had imposed some measures to regulate on re online religious activity before, most notably its decision to ban the sale of Bibles online, Xi himself brought the issue to the fore in another conference on religion at the end of last year. In addition to reiterating his earlier calls for the sinicization of religion, Xi's remarks at the conference insisted that, quote, China must strengthen the management of online religious affairs. Soon thereafter, Chinese officials then released new regulations banning foreign organizations from publishing content online and requiring re registered religious organizations to receive licenses for streaming religious services and ceremonies. Shortly after the regulations came into effect in March 2022, provincial governments began training new staff to censor online religious activity and ensure compliance with the new regulations. Importantly, these new regulations represent a significant and troubling expansion of China's surveillance state. Provincial authorities will still play a leading role in regulating religion as they have historically, but with the key agencies responsible for Chinese surveillance apparatus also jointly issuing the new online regulations, including the Ministry of Public Security, the oversight of religious activity now formally extends far beyond lo local administrators. Put in Orwellian terms, Big Brother now has clear authority to extend its watchful eye over people of faith. For Chinese citizens, what this means is that the surveillance and regulatory system that has long monitored their public religiosity now extends to private faith too. GPS sensors and smartphones and cars, plus facial recognition that can track citizens across a city, make it difficult for private and covert religious communities to form and operate undetected. Meanwhile, client and server-side scanning have made it possible to detect private religious activity like downloading a picture of the Dalai Lama 
or reading the Bible, while smart televisions and cell phones make it possible to remotely watch and hear private prayers within a home. Most importantly, the knowledge that state authorities are able to monitor even private relig religious activity can create a chilling effect that ultimately seeks to deter individuals from engaging in private religious expression at all. Worse, China's ongoing zero COVID policy stands to exacerbate these trends. With COVID restrictions requiring the frequent closure of houses of worship, online platforms and smartphone applications have enabled many household churches and other religious organizations to remain in community. The recent online regulations thus removes a key option for exercising private and public religion at a time when it is needed most. Yet as devastating as the Xi regime's digital authoritarianism and religious repression are for the Chinese people, they will not be felt solely within China's borders. The country has not only exploited popular messaging applications like WeChat to monitor diaspora communities abroad, it has also willingly sold its surveillance technologies for everything from computer vision to deep packet inspection to over 80 countries, including those like Iran, whose political leaders have explicitly lauded China's surveillance model and whose regime has a long history of targeting religious minorities for repression. The Xi regime's expansion of its surveillance state and recent crackdown on religious activity, both online and offline, cry out for a forceful response from the United States. Although the Biden administration has taken an increasingly hard line towards Beijing, particularly in denying it access to many of the advanced technologies its surveillance system relies on, much more can and should be done. Most notably, the U.S. government needs to formulate and execute a coherent plan for countering digital authoritarianism globally, and as importantly, or organize itself for the long-term nature of that threat. Absent a more comprehensive and persistent approach, the system of digital repression that has so tragically denied religious freedom to residents of Xinjiang and Tibet will not only persist, but stands to be re replicated among religious communities across the globe. In closing, thank you again for the chance to testify this morning, and even more for casting light on the daunting new era of religious persecution that the Chinese Communist Party has ushered in. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Messerol. And now we'll turn to Dr. Turks. Distinguished members of the commission, thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to participate. Today, through my testimony, I would like to highlight three aspects of the Chinese government's control of religion through digital authoritarianism. One, Chinese police engage in widespread digital surveillance of practitioners of banned faiths. Two, to surveil these practitioners, China's police collaborate with other party state offices. And three, police are now engaged in a mass DNA collection program targeting the people of Tibet. Understanding these surveillance programs and developing effective policies in response requires researchers capable of analyzing Chinese language sources. Therefore, today I will recommend that the United States government provide greater federal funding to Chinese and minority language learning programs at universities and colleges. My first point, well known to those who study state surveillance in China, is that China's police digitally surveil practitioners of banned faiths. Operating outside of China's system of officially recognized religions, China's banned faiths include the Falun Gong and the Church of Almighty God, among others. To China's police, practitioners of banned faiths are target people who threaten social stability. And as target people, practitioners are surveilled through police-run databases. Police collect personal data from practitioners, including data on their faith, and then categorize them according to the level of threat they purportedly pose. As a form of digital surveillance, these databases severely restrict practitioners' freedom. Police files on registered practitioners are associated with machine-readable national ID cards. For example, when a practitioner uses their national ID card to check into a hotel room, an alert is sent to the local police. Based on this alert, police can intercept the practitioner to interrogate or detain them. However, police cannot control practitioners through digital surveillance alone. This leads to my second point. In order to deepen state control of practitioners of banned face, police routinely collaborate with other party state offices to visit practitioners at their homes. These home visits play multiple roles. On the one hand, authorities may provide economically disadvantaged practitioners with social assistance. Assistance is meant to encourage practitioners to break with their faith and return to mainstream society. On the other hand, Home visits are also used to search for evidence of ongoing worship or to warn practitioners against associating with fellow believers. Home visits can also strengthen digital surveillance. Through home visits, party state officials collect personal information on practitioners, which is then added to police databases. 
Authorities have long used home visits and digital surveillance against religious minorities. And in the Tibet Autonomous Region, even practitioners of officially recognized religions like Tibetan Buddhism are subject to intense state control. However, under the Xi Jinping administration, new forms of biometric surveillance have emerged. This brings me to my third point. Since 2016, police in the Tibet Autonomous Region have engaged in a mass DNA collection program targeting the whole of the region. Mass DNA collection in Tibet is unconnected to any ongoing criminal investigation. Instead, police have, tar have targeted entire communities of Tibetan men, women, and children for DNA collection. The scale of DNA collection is immense. My research suggests that since June 2016, police may have collected DNA samples from between one quarter to one third of Tibet's population, or between 919,000 and 1.2 million DNA samples. DNA collection appears to be ongoing. And when completed, a mass DNA database covering Tibet will give police a powerful tool of social control to use against the region's people. Through digital surveillance, inter-bureaucratic cooperation, and mass DNA collection, China's police surveil and repress religious and ethnic minority communities. Understanding these developments requires researchers capable of analyzing the Chinese language sources which describe these surveillance programs. However, according to some reports, the study of foreign languages at U.S. universities and colleges is declining. This is worrying. If this trend is not reversed, the United States government may lack future researchers capable of understanding the control of religion through digital authoritarianism in China. This in turn will undermine the United States government's capacity to craft effective policies in response. Therefore, I recommend that the United States government do two things. One, increase federal funding for Mandarin and Cantonese Chinese language programs at universities and colleges. And two, increase federal funding for language learning programs at universities and colleges focused on minority languages spoken in China, including various Tibetan dialects, Uyghur, and others. Increased funding for language studies will lay a strong foundation for future research into the control of religion through digital authoritarianism in China. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Uh, I really appreciate the testimony from all three of you, and uh, I wanted to uh, uh, start with a, uh, uh, a question of trying to understand better uh, the control of uh, information. And I'm, I was thinking back to uh, 2011 when uh, Majority Leader Reid organized a group of a bipartisan delegation of, of 10 senators to visit China. Hu Jintao uh, was uh, the, the leader of China. And everything we heard while we were there was about how things were opening up. Uh, that there was less repression of religion, uh, that uh, labor leaders who had concerns were being encouraged to present them so that those issues could be addressed, that uh, environmentalists who were raising concerns about uh, pollution in the rivers were no longer considered kind of critics, but uh, helpful uh, advocates on, on how to address serious problems. There was just a kind of a, a whole trend. And then, uh, then in 2012, 10 years ago, uh, Xi Jinping became general secretary and, and uh, will probably soon be assigned to his third five-year uh, term. And it feels to me, uh, for, as an outside kind of observer, non-expert, that, that uh, his personal vision for China has been been driving a, a reversal of the trends that we saw uh, in 2011. And so I wanted to ask, and I, I um, don't want to take up the whole seven minutes with it, so perhaps um, uh, Dr. Messerol, do you want to take on this question? Is it is it right to perceive that uh, really, uh, Xi Jinping is driving this re kind of this massive national crackdown uh, that has many aspects, including the crackdown on on uh, religious worship. I, I think it's certainly right to to pin the extent and scale of the current um, uh, crackdown uh, on Xi Jinping and, and the the regime that he sits on top of. 
Uh, I will note that the the kind of digital surveillance apparatus that he inherited, you know, long predated him. Um, uh, it's something that kind of emerged uh, in the early 1990s and uh, uh, was kind of progressively built out uh, alongside the growth of the internet within China. What's, what changed under Xi Jinping um, uh, was kind of twofold. I think on the kind of broader sense of opening that you had mentioned, you know, there had been this kind of series of reforms that the Deng Xiaoping kind of era uh, from the early 1980s on had ushered in, uh, in a sense that kind of China needed to open up and kind of engage a little bit more with the rest of the world, which would be key to their economic growth, right? And I think that uh, uh, proved tremendously successful in terms of the economic growth that they were able to achieve. By the time Xi Jinping came in, um, I think that growth had started to slow a little bit. Um, and on top of that, he himself inherited a, an administration that had kind of decentralized uh, over you know, three decades by that point. Most of the focus had been decentralizing out some of the different centers of power uh, within China. And as an example of that, you know, there was something like 60 different regulatory agencies overlooking the internet and having different pieces of kind of say of the internet when Xi Jinping came to power. One of the first things he did when it comes to digital repression is consolidate all of those agencies under the, the cybersecurity administration in China um, and also kind of elaborate a little bit more clearly um, what, the, what the control authorities are of different agencies under his, under his direction. Um, and as a result, he's, ha he's been able over the last 10 years to exert greater and greater control over the digital surveillance system that they've developed uh, to the point where now I think it's kind of, you know, the, the scale, the extent, the reach, all of which are really unprecedented, I think do owe to him and are probably most responsible. Uh, he is certainly most responsible for both how it's built out and how it's directed at this point. Um, and I, I think it's, especially in light of the upcoming third term, potentially, I, I think it's alarming that he has so much control over it. Well, this digital surveillance is uh, scary, and then you throw in the uh, DNA uh, database surveillance. I'm I'm reminded of a movie from 25 years ago that was called Gattaca. The name came from the initials that represent the four bases of, of the DNA, and um, where you nobody could could move without being uh, watched very carefully, both from the perspective of what they were doing online and uh, and their DNA. And uh, here we are. Uh, this science fiction has become uh, a reality. Uh, one of the pieces of this uh, is the monitoring of, of websites. And uh, help us understand this. So uh, we, we hear that you ha now have to be registered to be able to kind of have a website that expresses anything that involves a, a religion. So I, in my mind, I'm, I'm picturing one, a, a system where no websites are uh, allowed to be accessed unless they're pre-registered, or I'm also picturing like the great, uh, I think it's some kind of called the great firewall. Uh, are there, do we have a, you know, there are a thousand uh, Chinese uh, basically tracking the, you know, every church in the in the world is putting something up on the web and saying no their website cannot be uh, accessed so is it an opt-in or opt-out system how do how do they do this i mean i'm really struck by the fact that you can now not kind of put your baptism uh up online or a sermon uh up on online that that uh the cath assist uh catholic app was shut down in uh, uh just last uh, month uh, that in um, May 2022, so just a few months ago, uh, China Aid Association reported that a, a website that had been up for 21 years, a Christian website, a repository of uh, music and hymns was, was shut down and uh, so on and so forth. Help us understand how the website control is being uh, operated. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great point. Um, I would say that there's kind of actually two levels of censorship of religious activity uh, in terms of, you know, if you are a church or a mosque or, or a temple in China um, and you're trying to have some kind of web presence, one option is to go out and just register a domain name and have, a, have, a, have an actual website um, uh, that's, uh, that your organization controls and owns. Um, to do that, you need to register, like there needs to be, you know, when, when somebody logs into a browser, and clicks, you know, or enters your URL into the browser and wants to visit your site. What there is on the back end uh, is a database of domain names that then kind of can take that that kind of string of text that you enter in for the URL and then translate it into the server 
that uh, host the content for that site. Um, and uh, what China can do is basically say, like, you need to you need to have a certain kind of registration requirements uh, to be able to get a domain name um, that we will put into our that kind of global database of uh, domain names and, and what servers they point to on the Internet. Um, it's, it's kind of this crucial choke point where the human readable part of the web meets the, the kind of uh, uh, digital kind of numeric part of the web. Um, and they can uh, very actively and easily set up processes where, again, you might need to register for a license to be able to get a domain name. Um, and that'll be tied to a, uh, that kind of central database that they have for domain names. The other, so that's kind of fairly straightforward to block. And it's something that the government is going to be in control over. The other way to do it is a lot of, you know, even now in the United States, for example, you'll see different religious communities sometimes not even register a website anymore. They'll just go on Facebook or they'll kind of use a social media app as their main kind of online presence. Um, and there, uh, similar things can happen uh, within China where the responsibility starts to lie less with the state and more with those kind of private companies. And actually one of the things that I'm most concerned about with um, this new set of online religious regulations is that uh, the same thing that we've seen play out in the non-religious space where uh, commercial entities within China are held more and more responsible for taking a, a, a proactive stance and censoring content, um, that will actually start to come into play with religion too, right? If, if a religious community is trying to use WeChat uh, or another app uh, as its de facto home on the online, that, uh, that application now is responsible for censoring that. And they're actually going to be more conservative than the government in many cases in uh, censoring content because for them, it's not clear, you know, it's not always clear what kind of communities are and aren't allowed. And so they'll, they'll default to the most conservative interpretation of that to stay in the good graces of the state. Um, but between that and the domain name registration uh, issue, it's, 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 you know, it's very straightforward for China to be able to start to block uh, religious groups from, from having uh, an online presence and, and being able to communicate with their community that way. Uh, thank you. Uh, and it's a, a scary as hell, and I'm worried about all the forms of the, this affects us here within the United States as, as well, uh, as we uh, address the challenges of uh, technology. So, um, but what China's doing and the example they're setting for other authoritarian regimes is uh, transforming the world, and so I'm so glad we're holding this hearing. Co-Chair McGovern. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me, uh, Dr. Dirks, uh, thank you uh, for the detail in your testimony about the collection of DNA of Tibetans in the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Um, it's very troubling, and I, I know it's not isolated. Um, Human Rights Watch says that co coercing people to give blood samples can violate an individual's privacy, dignity, and right to bodily integrity, and may constitute uh, uh, degrading treatment and as a mass policy is a serious human rights violation. What steps can the United States take to ensure that American companies are not complicit in this or that the, the research efforts uh, do not use this data? Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, the program as detailed uh, both in my own research and also in the recent report by Human Rights Watch is, is quite disturbing. Um, in terms of how the United States government or allies can ensure that uh, non-Chinese companies are not involved in these programs, um, one of the ways is to examine public procurement documents to ensure that uh, material produced by companies outside of China uh, are not being used in mass DNA collection programs, uh, for example, in Tibet. Um, but again, going back to my recommendations, um, one of the things that this requires are researchers who are able to dig through the public record that is often in Chinese and actually analyze these sources. So I think, again, it's, it's vital that we provide funding to Chinese language programs to ensure that researchers are actually capable of doing this kind of open source research in the future, which in turn would help to inform uh, effective US government policy in the future. Thank you, uh, Mr. Messerol. Um, you testify to China's role not only in exporting digital surveillance technology, but in providing the model that has normalized the practice of religiously motivated repression globally. Uh, you specifically cite the case of Saudi Arabia and the fact that it is used that, that it is used Israeli tech, not Chinese, uh, to surveil and target dissident communities at home and abroad. 
From the perspective of the individual, uh, do the human rights implications of digital surveillance differ depending on the status of the relations between the U.S. government uh, and the government doing their surveilling? Uh, and uh, excuse me, as a as public policy matter, would the challenges of digital authoritarianism be better addressed by focusing on the technologies and their use or by focusing on select countries? Um, I think I'll, uh, so just to, to answer the, the first part of the question about whether uh, from an individual's experience, whether it really matters, I would say, you know, if you're being repressed um, and you're being denied your ability to exercise religion freely, I'm not sure exactly that you care what layer of the tech stack that's happening at or kind of who's in control of that. Um, it does matter, I think, the U.S. involvement there in the sense that I think we have leverage over different regimes uh, that we can use and exercise uh, to get them to push back on this kind of uh, technology. And that's kind of where uh, I would turn to your to kind of second part of your question about digital authoritarianism. Um, I think we want to highlight um, uh, certainly that there are you know particular regimes like China, like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and others that I think are you know actively developing these kind of surveillance systems. My big fear is that there are, you know, 5 billion uh, people in the world who are not in China, not in the kind of US or Europe, um, and their digital infrastructure is being built out right now. Um, and we need to have kind of a, a proactive um, uh, and coherent set of like foreign policy effectively for how we want to challenge, well, how we want to handle this challenge of digital authoritarianism so that um, individuals around the world um, are able to exercise, you know, you know, their religion freely, are able to worship freely, are able to go online freely. And I think there, um, it would probably be, uh, you know, better served if there was a, a single coherent policy for the US government on, on digital authoritarianism, rather than what we see now, which is kind of China pops up and does something, Iran pops up and does something, and we don't really have, we're addressing it on a case by case basis, as opposed to Taking a much more pro, you know, proactive and coherent, uh, coherent view, which would be uh, ideally the direction we would go for the, the especially given the long-term nature of the challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Casel. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on the upcoming renewal of the Sino-Vatican Agreement uh, and the Vatican's uh, position going in? Thank you for for your question, Congressman. I should start by saying I don't have, I haven't reviewed the documents. I don't believe they're publicly available. So going into it, I think it's it's more of a wait and see as to what will come out of this agreement. Um, we haven't seen what this will mean for religious communities on the ground within China, especially the Catholic Church, and whether we'll see a greater integration between the underground Catholics and official Catholic Church. I think that is the hope potentially uh, coming from the Vatican, that this will be a pathway to allow greater expression for religiosity within China and a healing and bringing of these two churches together. But at this point, it is a wait and see until those documents, whatever will be released is available. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time. Uh, thank you, and Congressman McGovern, uh, the uh, Senate vote is under underway, and I know that we have uh, Congresswoman Hartzler uh, is waiting to ask questions. Can I turn the the gavel over to you for the the balance of the hearing? Absolutely, and I'll turn the the time over to Representative Hartzler. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you both, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this question is for Chris Mazzaroli. Um, to what extent are U.S. companies implicated in the PRC's digital repression of religion? And are there instances of U.S. application stores removing religious apps from their storefronts at the request of the PRC? And are there um, areas where U.S. companies might be vulnerable to participation knowingly or unknowingly in the repression of religion? Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, to the to the question about whether American companies are actively engaged in kind of removing religious content, et cetera, uh, I don't think I think it's kind of undeniably true at this point. You know, if you go to Amazon.cn, you know, you can't buy a Bible there. Um, uh, if you kind of use an iPhone, you know, there's certain kind of uh, religious apps that are not allowed uh, within China because they they follow the you know Chinese law. Um, and so uh, I don't think it's uh, 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 you know, controversial to say that we, we've, we've really, it's a challenge for American companies to operate in China and not follow these restrictions, which means that pretty much any 
uh, American company operating in China and uh, you know putting out a consumer facing application or platform app store, um, they're going to run into these uh, issues and they're going to have to comply with China or else they're going to have to leave the country. Um, and so those who are still there, I think we have to assume are in compliance with what China is doing. Um, more broadly, I think that there's uh, also the question of American firms and their um, uh, involvement uh, or kind of the use of their products within the surveillance state uh, itself. And there, I've, I've been really heartened to see um, the kind of more aggressive steps that the White House has started to take recently, and, and especially when it comes to export controls. So things like um, the uh, export control restrictions on NVIDIA's uh, uh, GPUs for uh, cloud computing servers, which are really the, the kind of best servers that you would want to use to train uh, AI models, in particular, the kind of AI models that are used in facial recognition. Um, so the, the best performing models for facial recognition, and we know that you know, China has developed machine learning models to explicitly identify religious minorities as they pass through the country. Um, those models were more likely than not trained on either uh, NVIDIA G, uh, GPUs or um, AMD GPUs. And, and those, uh, uh, you know, by banning the sale of those uh, GPUs to China, uh, it won't cripple them from being able to, to develop those kind of models, but it will hamper their ability to, to do them at scale, uh, especially as these technologies mature. Um, so I, I think uh, ideally we would continue to um, place more and more restrictions on the kinds of unique uh, uh, hardware that China relies on the U.S. for uh, to, to build to literally build out the surveillance surveillance apparatus that it's been developing. Well, that's that is encouraging that there's at least some uh, pushback that we are doing to be helpful here, and uh, so it's so important. We do not want to be complicit in any of this and anything that we can do uh, to stop this spread around the world, and also to help people of China, we need to, we need to do. So thank you very much for your testimony, your work, and all of the witnesses, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I, don't, I, I, don't, do I, I don't see any other members uh, or senators on the call. So I think that's, that will bring the questioning to an end. Let me just thank, again, the panelists. I think you're, um, you know, the, the, reminding us all about how important language promotion is um, is something that we need to uh, we need to act on. Uh, in the House version of the of the competes bill, um, there was a, a provision to put more money toward promoting uh, 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 the issue of language. I mean, we need to be teaching not just Mandarin but all the different dialects uh, um, in China, um, and hopefully we can continue to build on that and, and maybe figure out a way to get the. Senate to take it and, and we can move on that. And I also thought that uh, the suggestion that we need a common uh, US holistic policy on digital surveillance is something that we need to, uh, uh, we need to pursue. So um, again, I thank all of you for, for being with us and, uh, and for your excellent testimony. We may have additional questions which will follow up in writing, uh, but uh, let me just bring this hearing to a close and say thank you to everybody. Thank you.